Welcome to the Lighting Your Way podcast. I'm your host, Guardian Nurses founder, Betty Long. During season three, we'll be delving in deeper to the amazing lives and stories of nurses and other healthcare professionals from around the country. We'll also be talking with a few of my nurse advocate colleagues at Guardian Nurses. You'll get a behind the scenes peek at the healthcare system, as well as get advice on how to get the best care when you or a loved one is a patient. In continuing our series on the legends of nursing, we speak in this episode with Kathy Bauer, a celebrated and passionate nursing leader, author, speaker, and consultant who has traveled the world preaching the gospel of care coordination. In her retirement, Kathy still volunteers on several boards in her community, as well as with local and national nursing organizations. It was my treat to speak with her on May 6th, National Nurses Day. Take a listen. Welcome to the Lighting Your Way podcast, Kathy Bauer. It I am giddy to, to talk with you this morning. And I am delighted to be here and uh, honored to be here. Thank you. Oh, no, listen, uh, the, the pleasure is all mine, I think. Um, so as we have done in our Legends of Nursing podcast in the, in the last couple of weeks, uh, we want to talk about you and we want to talk about your career. So uh, we wouldn't be, I guess it wouldn't be com complete to not talk about your growing up and how you made the decision uh, to go into nursing. So tell me about your early days. Where were you born? You know, what did your parents do? Well, that's kind of interesting in and of itself, and thank you for considering me a legend. A lot of people <laughs> think I think I'm a legend in my own mind, but that's another story for another right. day. <laughs> so uh, just a quick aside, my mother was from Hamilton, Ontario. She and her family moved to Detroit, Michigan when she was uh, going into her teens. She and my father went to high school together. And obviously became sweethearts. Okay. My dad became a first um, of his family to go to college and then to medical school. And so he became a physician. My mother was a bookkeeper. And somewhere towards the end of my father's medical school the internship, they got married. <clears throat> and then, of course, there was a small issue of... World War II, my dad mm -hmm. had thought he would go into an orthopedic residency, but ended up being drafted and got sent to the Pacific Theater mm -hmm. in World War II. And um, actually, that was a turning point in my father and mother's life, because his commanding officer out in the Pacific, when the war was over, everybody was back, my dad was planning to go back for his residency and his whatever. And his uh, commanding officer called and said, how would you like to come to this little Appalachian town and become a physician in our group practice here? And we would love to have you. And it oh. was a Appalachian town, coal mining, um, tobacco growing, Wow. And no diversity, and okay. I mean none of any okay. kind. And so that's kind of where my parents were, and I admired them for picking up their roots because that's exactly what they did. Yeah. They picked up their roots and moved to this very small town. Wow. It was probably the best move of their lives, actually, as it turns out. So why? Tell me why. Because I think my dad, as a physician, he didn't miss, and as an obstetrician, by the way, didn't miss any of our growing up stuff, recitals, uh, games, that kind okay. of thing. Okay. Because it was a small enough, it was a 3,000 citizen town, and so people knew where to get them. Okay. Um, if a woman was in labor, somebody could find them somehow. <laughs> and they did. We had, we had party lines for, on the phone. So, uh, I mean, you know, he was, he didn't have a pager. He didn't have a beeper, anything like that. But they knew where to find him. It was the early um, 
finding system before we had cell phones. Right, right. Yeah, the community. So there were 3,000 people in the town? 3,000 people, yes. But it served, the hospital served an area probably of around 100 miles. Oh. And people would come in from the coal mines and that sort of thing um, from all the areas. And there were two hospitals in town. Each one was about 100 patients. Mm -hmm. And I still think what was interesting was there were no private physician practitioners in town. You were either affiliated with one or the other, but not both. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you don't think of that. You think of a small town like, you know, the small town dock, but they were in groups, which I guess there's strength in numbers. Well, so, and particularly since my dad was often the only obstetrician and the uh, other family practitioners in the group when he needed time off would step in for him. So that was how he kind of got time off. Which uh, was good. Oh, oh, right, right, right. God. So so you you watch your father as you as he's practicing. So like how did yeah. you I don't I don't want to lose you from the nursing uh, fold, but. Why yeah, did no. you not become a doctor? You you see your dad doing his thing, but yet you just you chose to become a nurse. So how was that? How did you get to that? Well, I think I think there were a couple of influences. One was Cherry Ames, and uh. for the listeners who don't know Cherry Ames, she was a <laughs> fictional nurse written by Helen Wells, and and the second author for some of the book was a woman named Julie Tatum. And Cherry was a vivacious nurse. The books were written to encourage young women during the war and shortly after to go into nursing to fill the ranks of health care because they needed so many for the war. And Mm -hmm. as nurses went off to war, they needed to replace them in cities and towns. Right. Okay. So she was an amazing nurse. She was a student nurse. She was a senior nurse. Then she went in. She was an army nurse. She was a flight nurse. And then after the war, her career really took off. I mean, (laughs) this woman went everywhere. She was a jungle nurse, a dude ranch (laughs) nurse, a department store nurse, a (laughs) cruise nurse. She was every, a country doctor's nurse. So she was kind of an inspiration. Okay. The other thing was, when I was in high school, I um, wanted to work. So I got a job in the OR at this small hospital. And the OR was run by Miss, no mistaking, Miss Wheeler. Okay. Miss Wheeler ran <laughs> a good OR. Okay. I can imagine. All I can imagine. The, oh yeah, no, she was, but she was kind and she was generous with her knowledge and she loved what she did. So I was under the tutelage of Miss Wheeler, and let me just tell you, so you know really how old and ancient I am. I'm going to give you an example of three things that were on my job description as a <laughs> OR aide in this hospital. One was to um, rub needles along a pumice stone to get the burrs off the end. Wow. After which you would put them on a gauze strip, fold them up and pack them up and put them in the autoclave. Wow. The other thing that was my job, and this was a backbreaker, I can tell you, was you washed the surgeon and the nurse's gloves. You then had a powder box. So you would stand and you put your arms through the sleeves, yeah. And you would toss the toss the gloves so that they would get powdered and could go on. And then you took them out, and you had a cloth uh, wrapper. You put the right one on the right side, the left one on the left side. You made the cuff. You put it. You put the autoclave tape on. They went in the autoclave. Wait, weren't they? Didn't I guess now? You know, I'm dating myself. They didn't have rubber gloves, like sterile rubber gloves, latex. What what kind of what what was the material in the gloves that you're washing? You know, I don't. That's a good question. I don't know, and I don't think as a 14, 15 year old, I ever thought to ask because that was it. That, <laughs> right. there, there were no 
there were no options. So wow. that wow. was, um, a bit. and the other thing I will say is I thought I wanted to go into nursing to become a nurse anesthetist. Oh. Uh, in retrospect, the anesthetist in the town and kind of wasn't totally licensed. I don't think he was a clinician in either in any way. He had oh, been in God. the service, so he had been trained. Okay. But what they were using was drip ether. Oh God! Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> so point made, I, Kath. Point made. <laughs> I was fascinated by this. I loved bringing patients down for their OR, for their OR experience, and talking to them on the way down. I, I really found it fascinating, the surgical component of it. But right. when I got into nursing school, I figured I really liked my patients best awake. <laughs> so I chose yes. not to go into the nurse and that's just route, but to, to stay in nursing. It okay. was a decision I have never one moment in my life regretted, ever. It's wonderful. It's the best that... profession I could have ever chosen for me. Great. Uh, and and you left uh, the small town to go to the big city for your education. You went to Washington, D.C. to go to Georgetown. So that was a big stretch, well, right? No, it wasn't, actually, and I'll tell you why. There were two things. One of the questions that I get asked a lot is, how did you end up from this small town going to a baccalaureate program? Right. Well, my dad wasn't enthused when I made the announcement that between microbiology and nursing, I had chosen nursing. Now, where I got <laughs> microbiology in my head as a career choice, I can <laughs> I will never be able to tell you, but yeah, there it was. And if so, you like, if you like talking to patients, I'm not sure microbiology is your your uh, no. dream. And it was the bane of my existence in nursing school. It was mm. really a tough course for me. So, <clears throat> my dad, I think, and I, I'm trying not to be um, pejorative here, but all the, there was an LPN school in this hospital. And so all the nurses in the in the hospital, except for very few, were LPNs. And I think my father saw them as task oriented and following orders oh, and oh. doing, you know, all the dirty tasks. Right. So I got a call one day to come to Mr. Homer Allen's office. He was the hospital administrator. Uh oh. And he said in his southwestern Virginia way. Kathleen, I understand you want to become a nurse. So Mr. Allen calls you into his office and suggests that you go to a baccalaureate program. So he was really ahead of his time at that point, Kath, right? This is the 60s? This was the 60s, and he was very much ahead of his time. Ooh. And I think what it says to me, I remember his name. I remember sitting in his office. And I think it says to me that we have an obligation as nurses, as professionals, to mentor and and support people coming into the profession in terms of where they get their education, helping them get their education and that sort of thing. It was an amazing piece of advice he gave me, and I'm grateful. Well, and, and you go from the small town of Virginia to the big city of Washington, D.C., and you, you go to Georgetown, but what was that transition like for you? Well, it actually wasn't much of a transition because my mother was very, very pro-education. She, I, I'm still not entirely sure why she was so adamant about a good education. But the town that I was in did not have a good education system at the time. It was... Uh, the baby boomers were coming through. There was split shifts in school. Uh, a lot of the teachers did not have appropriate uh, credentials. Oh. So my mother and father came to me one day and asked if I would consider going away to school. <laughs> They're high trying school. to get rid of you. Would have been. <laughs> so I think they were trying to get rid of me, actually. Now, in <laughs> retrospect, I said, so, so be it. But I was, I always had an adventuresome side. 
so I ended up going to Georgetown's Visitation Preparatory School, which was an all-girls school taught by the Sisters of Visitation, who I will say to this day are amazing, amazing educators. Well. And as it happened, it was right beside Georgetown. <laughs> so when it came time to apply, um, I applied to four schools. My safety net school was University of Virginia because I was a Virginia resident. Okay. Um, but I got accepted into Georgetown and decided to go. So oh. it wasn't a huge transition for me Leap. to go from this 3,000 person town to Washington, D.C. Yeah. So wow. it, was, it was a great place. Yeah, and Georgetown still continues with a wonderful nursing program down there. So right. you were one of the right. early trendsetters there, setting your setting your right. mark. <laughs> right. I don't think I could get in today, but I got in then. So there you go. Isn't that the truth? I feel that way too sometimes. Um, so you graduate from Georgetown. Then you, you head north to New York City because you haven't had enough of the big right. city. Uh, you work right. at NYU for two years. And then... You go further north to Boston in 72. Right. I was going, uh, right. I was going straight up the, N9, the I-95 corridor. <laughs> well, up. you skipped, just, you just skipped right up. over. How come you skipped over Philadelphia? I don't know. I'll have to go back and review <laughs> that in my, uh, in my history. <laughs> Thank you. But, yes, a number, a number of my classmates were from the New York, New Jersey area. And so there were a bunch of us that just kind of all said, let's go work in New York, okay. where we made $7,000 a year, by the way. Wow. Um, and you worked in the, and you were able to work in New York. Wow. Well, that was good money in those days. So we did. And um, it was a great experience. I worked on a plastic and general surgery floor at NYU, and I then went to the ICU. Oh, okay. So I okay. had about a year and a half of ICU and a half a year of basically surgery and okay. plastic surgery. Okay. So my roommate in New York at the time, one got married, one had gotten accepted at Boston College for her master's, and I decided I wanted to stay in New York for one more year. It was a fun place to be. It was a good place, and I was learning a lot at NYU. Yeah. yeah. So I, during that year, applied to get into D.C. and did. And so at the end of my two-year tenure at NYU, I went further north on 95 and <laughs> went to Boston College for my master's. And my and- master's, interestingly enough, was in as a cardiology, no, cardiovascular clinical specialist, which when I tell people that now, they kind of look at me and go, really? <laughs> you, you should know about heart. <laughs> like, yeah, I did. I was pretty good at it. <laughs> yeah. The heart hasn't changed much. It's still the heart. I don't think it's, nothing has changed. It's still the heart, but they're finding, you know, it, what I found interesting about this, Betty, is when I was in nursing school, probably when you were in nursing school, we didn't know as much at the cellular level that we do today. And True. I think that's made a huge difference in every branch of medicine, healthcare, all of it. It's it's all there. It's at the cellular level now. See, and, and that's why you were wanted to go into microbiology, but you didn't. There yeah, you go. Right. <laughs> yeah, that was the best decision I ever made, not to go into <laughs> microbiology. It was a tough course when I was at Georgetown, and let's just I, say I wouldn't have made it past. Um, right. You know, I, it was it was a good decision. Let me just leave it like that. So so a master's in nursing and then you so you're yep. in Boston and yep. you get you begin working at the New England Medical Center as a as a nurse manager. Right. Okay. And and then so, five years later you're the vice chair of nursing. That seems like a swift uh move into <laughs> into management. <laughs> Tell me about that. Well so when I graduated from Boston College, there was a friend of mine that I had known in New York. She had returned to Boston, and she was working at New England Medical Center and said, come over. It's a good place to work, interview, and let's see if there's any place that will be a fit. So I did. It did. And it was a good fit. Okay. So 
I started out as we had um, an interesting organizational structure. The person at the top was the chairman, and that made her at the same level as the physician chairman of medicine, pediatric surgery, all of that. Okay. Then we had vice chairman, and there were three of them. And then below that, there were what were called nurse leaders who were basically like directors today. And then assistant nurse leaders were nurse managers. Okay. And associate nurse leaders were the evening and night clinical supervisors. And we also had administrative assistants. So I went into that organizational structure as a night associate nurse leader. Okay. So I was a night clinical supervisor, and I loved it. It was fun because I could interact with the staff. I could peek in on the patient, see what was going on with them. Okay. Um, I will tell you one funny story. Uh, we had metal bedpans in, at that time. <clears throat> so I went in to assist a patient and took the bedpan out and brought it back. And as I brought it back, I dropped it. I think oh. the entire unit heard the oh. metal bedpan oh. hitting the... <laughs> oh. Hitting the floor. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why they took me off nights real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or change so the metal nephew, bedpans to, to plastic. Yeah, well, no, those weren't available then. Wow. So the next thing that happened was I became a nurse leader, which was a day clinical supervisor. Okay. So I had clinical and kind of administrative responsibility for a number of units, and those got configured and reconfigured and all of that. And so it, that was fun, too, because I worked with the assistant nurse leaders who were the nurse managers. Okay. But it was still a clinical focus, okay. and it was still uh, how can we make this patient care the best we can? How can we make this nursing practice the best that we can? Okay. So... I did that for about four and a half years. I'm trying to think anyway, the months are important. And then I got promoted. Well, we had a nurse, we had a, at the time we had our chairman of nursing, her name was Martha Sackey and she was another significant influence in my life. She mm -hmm. was a, um, an Italian American from West Virginia, if you can imagine such a thing. Wow. Yeah. And she had all sorts of, of sayings that she would pull out at the oddest times, but she was spot on for patient care. Okay. Spot on for nursing practice. She left to go become the vice president for nursing at Johns Hopkins. Wow. Wow. Sandy okay. Tryon, who was her one of her associates became chairman. And Ch Sandy was another person who really moved nursing practice forward. Good. So I, when, when all that happened, I became an associate chairman, which means that I was like an assistant vice president. Okay. For the department. Well, what's interesting at, at, you know, I have not heard, I mean, this is the sixties, right? Seventies. And, and they're t calling nurse managers leaders, which is kind of cool, right? It is cool. We yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah, that's that's great, yeah. right? To, to okay. Um, so where in this is where in your career, this is where you get involved in establishing the Center for Nursing Case Management, right? So is this the eighties when DRGs are coming out? What what was the? Well, I need I need to back up just a little bit. Okay. One of the things that as an executive team and as a leadership team, and I mean the whole leadership team, the assistant nurse managers, everybody. We did a couple of things. One is we had our department goals were established October, November every year. Okay. Based on that, we set up mandatory management development classes for the following year. Mm -hmm. And we ran six or eight of them a year, a, a, a month. Wow. And you did not miss them. Wow. 
So we were really looking at how to make sure that the on-unit managers could really support excellent exemplary patient care and a, and a superb practice environment. Okay. So one of the things we started looking at was primary nursing, because that was when primary nursing was beginning to emerge. Okay. And we felt that that would be a good fit because it focused on a nurse's accountability, not just responsibility, but his or her accountability for the patient and the patient's outcomes at the end of that stay. Okay. Now, I have to acknowledge, we had some things that kind of helped. Patients were in the hospital for a long time. Right. Nurses worked mostly full time. So we, we had a good mix and match. Okay. But Sandy had this ability to say, if we're going to do this, we have to be able to guarantee that every patient has a primary nurse and that they know who that primary nurse is. Uh, so she would go on rounds and walk in and say to the patient, so how are you doing with your primary nurse? And <laughs> If the patient said, great, you know, Betty Long is just a fabulous nurse. I really appreciate her. Then that would be, everybody would breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> Andy walked into the, into the patient's room and said, how are you doing with your primary nurse? And the patient went, what? <laughs> I never heard that. So what we ended up doing, and this sets the stage for some of the later work we did. We started an audit of primary nursing. Does the patient know who his or her primary nurse is? Okay. Is there evidence of the primary nurse in the patient's patient record? So oh. we just did, had they given them, we had the primary nurses give them business cards. Did the patient have a business card? So oh. was that relationship established? So then, the, so that created a really strong primary nursing system and actually we were doing national symposia on primary nursing, where oh. we have 100, 200 people coming from around the country. So was the this, next thing this, we started... Was this the, is this the early ahead. 80s, Kath? Give me a timeline. Is this the probably, early 80s? Probably would have been late 70s. Late 70s. Middle to late 70s. Okay. So, because, and again... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, what I'm saying, you know, I remember back, you know, when I was in nursing school, it was, it was 83 and, you know, there were no whiteboards in the patient room, right, to say, hey, right. Betty's your nurse and, you know, here's her cell number, whatever. So this is done, you know, you're walking into the patient room and, and keeping your fingers crossed that they know who you are, right? Interesting. Right. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I'm well, sorry. You you walked in that pa and we oriented all nurses, when they came on for their onboarding process, which we called orientation in those days, right? we oriented them to the primary nursing practice. How do you be a primary nurse? What does okay. it mean? How do yeah. you fulfill that? So then we started, we had the privilege, and, and I, I, I look back on it and say, I know that not every place could have evolved the way we did. But New England Medical Center was a closed practice. So all of the physicians there, we had maybe 10 community physicians who had okay. privileges. Everybody, and they were all, um, most of them were also faculty of one level or another at Tufts Medical School. Okay. But what that meant is their clinic practices were also on site. So if you were going to have a total hip, which, by the way, you'd be in the hospital for two weeks for, <laughs> as opposed to overnight now at best, right, right. you would come and see the surgeon preoperatively at the New England Medical Center ambulatory area. You'd come to the New England Medical Center OR, PACU, orthopedic floor, and then go back out to the um, ambulatory area. So we started thinking, what would happen if we got nurses from those areas together? And so we could create almost like a relay race. We could transition the patient smoothly 
mm-hmm. from ambulatory to inpatient to OR to unit, right. back out to ambulatory. And so those nurses in those areas began to meet every week and talk about who the patients were in their practice. Okay. Not just patients, but their practice. Okay. So that that became a real learning lab for us because the other thing we started discovering, and this is where your mention about the DRGs comes to fruition. 1983, there's yeah. a rumor that DRGs are going to start. Massachusetts was a waiver state. We could see what was happening in other states. The <clears throat> length of stay in the hospitals was dropping like a rock. Uh-huh. There were a lot of people who were concerned that patients were being discharged too early. Okay. They would be readmitted. And so there was a lot going on. And we started to think about, well, we know that there were things that were being done out of sequence in the inpatient setting. There were days that you lost because of something. Okay. So we we went and we talked to some very skilled nurses okay. and some very um, logical, I don't, that's not quite the right word, but you'll get what I mean. They knew what they were doing because they could project what the patient's course should be. Okay. Okay. It wasn't a surprise to them that the patient's NG tube should be taken out on the third day or their okay. catheter should be taken out on the fourth day, whatever. And okay. they were the ones that would say, hey, wait a minute, why is this catheter still in? Why hasn't this patient switched from IV to PO antibiotics? To map out a diagnosis for us, just kind of take it from beginning to discharge. And we started with inpatient. And you know what? They did. Oh, and you know okay. what? That became a clinical pathway. Ah, okay, okay. Ding, 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 so ding. Now we have, now we have continuity of plan. Now we have continuity of provider. Oh. Now oh. we have Nirvana. <laughs> you think? Truly. <laughs> well, you know, it was because the nurses felt very professional. It was a very professional practice, and the patients got really fantastic care because the other thing that we did i guess i'm bragging i think i have a right to brag anyway (laughs) the other thing that we did was we said we don't want patients coming back to the hospital after they've been discharged so what's it going to take and we were all into patient teaching and and all of that and we started saying We need to be able to have as a standard that if you have come into our hospital and you have had a myocardial infarction, that you will have a standard base of education that is given to you without fail before you go home. Wow. Jesus. (laughs) I mean, think about it now. People are in and out and barely get a chance to understand what just happened to them. Correct. Wow. Correct. So we developed patient teaching plans. Uh-huh. And if you came in with a heart attack, the nurse, the primary nurse would take the heart attack patient teaching plan and would go over it with you. You'd get a copy, a copy went into your chart. Okay. So what started to happen was this whole, it became an explosion. We wrote three or four books on patient education and published our patient teaching plans. Wow. Um, Karen Zander, who was our organizational development specialist for the Department of Nursing, that name will come up again. Yes. Um, wrote a book on primary nursing. Oh. We then wrote a couple of, and published uh, on our own, published books on case, workbooks on case management. What is it? How do you do it? What are right. the, all that? 
So we we now had this kind of thriving little innovation lab. Yeah. And at some point, I think it was around 1988, our chair, Sandy, got recruited to be the VP for nursing at the Toronto Hospital in Canada. Oh. So a couple of us, Karen and I, basically, and I had transitioned over because I was really interested in this little lab that was going on. Okay. We were starting to get a lot of calls for, and we, and we were doing conferences on case management. People were coming because, remember, people were trying to figure out how to reduce the length of stay and not right. Right. be a huge increase in your um, readmissions. So we were getting a lot of calls. Can you come talk to us about case management? Can you come help us develop case management and clinical paths for our organization? Okay. And we did. But you can't (laughs) do that and run a hospital. So I said, I'm intrigued by this. I'd like to follow this through. So I moved over. We did create the Center for Nursing Case Management. It was a for-profit division of the Center for Nursing of the Department of Nursing at the New England Medical Center. Interesting, right? It well, sounds new. Right. Well, it sounds like you were at the the ground, the, the beginning, right, of all it of was. this energy g- going into right. both patient education and, you know, nursing right. empowerment, if you will, right? Because, you know, back then, primary nursing, that was kind of what it was about, right? Not only accountability, right. as you said, but uh, so let me just ask you a quick question. When primary nursing, because yeah. I think that's what I learned when I was in nursing school, what was the standard? Did you guys just develop like four to one, five to one? What, what, how did you determine staffing? Because as your chief nurse said, we need to be able to, you know, do this and have a primary nurse for each patient. So, because you know, there was a nursing shortage too, right? Ever- well, there, of course, there have been periodically. I think this one's going to be one of the worst that we've seen for a long time. But I don't know that we've had standards at that okay. time. We did. Okay. We, one of the things that we believed, and one of the reasons that we were so intent on management development was our belief was that the assistant nurse leader or the nurse manager of the unit knew what staffing he or she needed for that shift, that day, that that month. And there were times that we had to negotiate and say, let's think about this again. But they were really, uh, our mission, we had no clinical specialists because the other thing that we assumed was that that leader, that nurse who's leading that unit yeah. was also the clinical expert for that unit. If they didn't come in as the clinical expert, like if yeah. they came from medicine and went into surgery, yeah. they, their mission was to become a clinical expert real quick. Okay. Huh. So I don't know that we ever did the ratio Thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's it's it sounds like really an exciting time, and no wonder you kind of jumped oh, up, jumped ship, and went into that. So, yeah, so that the fabulous. center, and and that still exists, right? The center, I think it's changed names, but it's the Center for Case Management. Is that still in existence? Well, what happened was Sandy left. She negotiated it out, so it now became a private corporate entity. Okay. And she was running it from Canada. Karen and I had moved out of New England Medical Center to South Natick, which is where the home base was at that point. Okay. And um, then Sandy came to us and said, I, I can't run a thousand bed, <laughs> thousand bed right. hospital. And do this. <laughs> and, and worry about the, the economic right. whatever over here. So she basically, and it was very generous of her, she basically gave it to us. Oh, cool. Oh, she, very she good. She transitioned it to us. Great. So Karen and I became the co-owners of the Center for Case Management at that point. Because okay. it wasn't that we didn't want to acknowledge nursing. We wanted to take it 
broader right. than right. nursing. Right. And I think the other thing was was case management was shifting. It's all to me, the core of primary nursing case management, how you give good care to patients is how you coordinate their care. How you manage their care, how you make sure that things aren't missed, how you keep things in sequence, how you anticipate what's going to happen with this patient. Well, so, true, truer words have never been spoke, Kath. <laughs> I know. Well, however, it, you know, that's what across my forehead somewhere is coordinate care. <laughs> what were you just saying? No, well, I, I think, you know, you've, your career has, your passion is, is about case management, yeah. about coordinating care, Correct. right? And, and right. like I, I well, you and I have joked, I mean, I, I've been a nurse for just a mere 36 years and, you know, each decade, it seems like the healthcare system struggles to kind of understand this care, this coordinated care, right? Like when I was a manager. I agree. We did um, patient focus care, and I thought, wait a minute, I thought we were focusing on patients. Then right. now, <laughs> more, more, why did we not? <laughs> right, I was. I don't know about you guys. Um, more recently, you know, we've heard about the medical home. So these are just two examples. Why do you think, in your career, as you've looked back, why does our healthcare system struggle with what seems to be an easy concept for most nurses, which is coordinate the care, get the best, give the best care. It will matter in the end to the patient. What's the, you know, what's the dis- difficulty? I, I think I'm going to say something that might make people hang up from listening <laughs> to the podcast. But I think some of it has been we have not focused nursing practice on outcomes. We focused them on tasks. Oh, and good. if yeah. what you are doing is focusing on tasks, you are more rote. You're not critically thinking. Not to thinking, me, right. the nurse that I want taking care of me is Detective Clouseau. If something's going amiss, if something's right. not going in the way that I would have thought it would, I want that nurse to be on top of it. Right. And I don't know that we have created nursing roles to fulfill that. I don't know that we have held them accountable for that. I think there are many, many nurses who do do it, but we haven't systematized it. And I think until we do that and until we say coordination of care is the core of what nurses do, right. what the core of what doctors do, PT, everybody, everybody has to focus on it. And the payment system has to play into this, too. Uh, right now, we have thing, still fee for yep, service. Yep. Well, for and, the most and part. DRGs, yes, but, you know, really. Well, and nursing, this is, for me, the bane of, uh, of the whole healthcare system is that nursing is part of the room and board. So when you talk about the healthcare system and, yeah. and and the reimbursement changing, we're not recognizing the value of nursing or good nursing or coordination of care. So right. that in and of itself, if we did that, then there would be more emphasis placed on the coordination of care and who's leading it, because I think nurses are leading it. I, I agree. I just, I've thought about this for a long time, and I'm not sure how it can be done but i know there are people working on it but i don't i don't know i i really don't want to see nursing get into the position where it gets cut because it's not perceived as a revenue generator Uh well yeah you know that's true but if you think about it we are a cost avoider well correct but if you get back to your point about outcomes instead of tasks. Right. Right. So the outcomes could be, you know, patient doesn't come back or patient gets out one day earlier or right. something. Um, yeah. We're, I don't, sadly, I don't think we're going to figure it out today, but it's always fun and to I don't talk think about. I we're going to figure it out in my lifetime. That's, <laughs> no, that's the no, thing that wait. scares me. No, no. Be more optimistic. Um all right, I have another question because I, I want to get to some of the quit. So you have had the joy of traveling, uh, given the you know given the groundswell oh, yeah. at the Center oh. for Case Management. 
What, like, right. I, I was just curious, was there anything that struck you during all the interactions with the international nurses about the universality of nursing? Yes. Yes, it is universal. <laughs> that's what, that's, okay. that's kind of what struck me. The, that, but I think the thing that that was based on was the needs of patients are universal. Correct. Okay. And nurses right. figure out how to help patients overcome the barriers. And I'll give you an example. I worked with a group in Singapore called the SAO Foundation, TSAO. It's a philanthropic foundation from a large, I believe they do a lot with shipping. Oh, okay. The head of the organization is one of the family members, and she's a physician. And she and her family started this foundation to help the community care Mm -hmm. of Singaporeans, particularly elderly Singaporeans. So I was there one day, and we were talking about case management in the community, and they're doing a fabulous job. And they were giving me some examples of some barriers that those nurses faced with with their patients. Mm -hmm. And one of them just took my breath away. So they had these high-rises in Singapore, and when they built the high-rises, they put an elevator landing on every other floor. Oh. So Why? That was years, well, that to save money. That was years ago, and people were young, and they could go up or down a floor. But now you have this elderly population So one of the first questions the case managers in the community have to ask is, are you on an elevator or a non-elevator floor? Oh, wow. Because that's (laughs) going to determine whether or not we can get you off your floor. Oh, gosh. Jeez. So, you know, it's and and your guardian nurses do similar things. Yes. You you try and leverage things about how you can make it so this patient can get out of their apartment into a physician office or wherever they need to go right. without having to go down a flight of stairs. Wow. Wow. That's, so, yeah, that's fascinating. Probably, you must have seen a lot of those, it's like, kind of oh unique God, circumstances. It was, it was fascinating. The other thing that we saw, a colleague and I, Jackie Somerville, uh, Jackie was working with us at the Center for Case Management. We got a contract with a uh, pharmaceutical company in South Africa. And what they were doing, they wanted to have a case management program to accompany their medications. And oh. I didn't realize it at the time, but South Africa has a just an amazingly high asthma population. Oh, I don't okay. know if that's still true because this was a, this was a number of years ago. Okay. So we uh, uh, the barriers that the patients face there, they could only get their drugs refilled the day before or the day after or the day of the date that the prescription was wow. would expire. Yikes. And the pharmacies were only open Monday through Friday, nine to five. Oh. That and causes a problem. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> That's going to cause a problem. Right. So it became, a, a, you know, nurses are good at logistics, and they, right. and so are social workers, by the way, and PT. Yeah. And so it became an interesting piece. But then the other thing we started talking about, and mind you, my doctoral dissertation was in what were some of the factors that went into whether or not patients follow their um, treatment plan, otherwise known as noncompliance, which is a term <laughs> I hate. And by the way, let me just put this out to um, the listeners, wherever you are, never say in my presence frequent flyers. Okay. It's a it. pejorative term, and patients don't get up in the morning and say, I'm not going to follow my plan. There's all sorts of reasons that go behind this. So Jackie and I were sitting, I can still see this conference room in South Africa, Johannesburg, and we started talking. And my, because of my dissertation, I 
has looked at a lot of theories and this, that, and the other thing. And one of the things that we came out with, and I'm sorry to say we didn't do much with it beyond where they were in South Africa, we came out with an algorithm that would help people kind of diagnose why a patient was having, was struggling with following their treatment plan. Okay. And if you think about it, it's relatively simple. Does the patient know the plan? And a lot of them don't. Right. Does the patient believe that the diagnosis that he or she was given is really the diagnosis that they have? Oh. Do they have the economic means to follow the plan? Okay. And it's not just whether or not the medicine is affordable. It's also things like nutrition, you know, and so those were, I mean, this is what gets me excited about nursing and what we have as the capacity. But at the end of the day, your question is, what did I learn? I learned that patients throughout the world have similar issues and nurses deal with them every day, very creatively. I was just, yes, I was just going to say it very creatively, very creatively. Absolutely. You know, when I think about what the staff of guardian nurses do, they are creative in getting things moving for the patients that they're dealing with. Yes. They don't just say, oh, yeah, well, you got this problem. I'm sorry. That's that's a tough problem. You're right. 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 Exactly. (laughs) See you later. (laughs) Yeah. They're, they're They're creative and they're relentless. So that's what I like to use yeah. the word relentless. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So let me, let me, I know we have a few minutes, so let me talk about your awards. I, I do want to mention oh. them. Oh, you oh. to? <laughs> yes. So you've received a lifetime achievement award from the American Academy of nurse executives. You've been designated as a fellow in the American Academy of nursing. And most recently uh, in the American organization of nursing leadership, what, what, when you look back, what do those awards mean to you, Kath? Well, first of all, I am extraordinarily, extraordinarily humbled by them. I have, uh, the other piece that's very passionate for me is nursing leadership. I have, um, I do not believe you can ever have exemplary care in a, professional practice environment without strong leadership. So I've been a member of, uh, an active member of the Organization of Nurse Leaders for over 40 years. And of the American Organization for Nursing Leadership for over 40 years. And I, I guess I've been recognized for some of the volunteer work that I've done over the years, Um, you know, one of the things that really hit me was I received the Elaine K. Sherwood Award from the uh, Organization of Nurse Leaders, which was the Massachusetts Organization of Nurse Executives. We kind of switched the names around. And the irony was uh, I got that for my work with ONL, but what kind of got me was my best friend from college was Elaine Sherwood. And she had had the award (laughs) named after her because she had done a lot of work before her death. And I was like blown away. Oh, that's so cool. I, it was very cool. I right now work very diligently and relentlessly and persistently to find as many ways as I can to get nurses recognized. Mm. So I want other nurses to have the opportunities that I have had to be recognized. Mm. So I nominate people to be fellows in the American Academy of Nursing. I nominate people to be awarded at ONL, okay. it's it's important that we recognize people. And I have been 
so blessed and so fortunate to have that recognition. But you know what, Betty? I do it all without any recognition. Right. It's important work. Right. And it's critical work. We've got to do it for the next generations. We've got to do it because I'm going to need good nursing care at some point. <laughs> yes. I, I know you're smart. You're looking downfield. Hey, you know, I, I love it. And, and I will say, looking back on my career, who else would have the fortune of getting the education that I've gotten, having the professional opportunities that I've had? I've, I've traveled all over the world and loved it and been able to see different parts of the world, understand that my little area is not the end of the world. It's it's a small piece of it right. and be able to say, sure, I'll, I'll do it. You know, I'll help. Yeah. So it's, it's truly an amazing opportunity. And you've had it too. If yes. You think about it. Yes. Yes. No, I, I absolutely agree. And I think it is important to, to lift up other nurses and certainly to recognize them, especially on, as we talk on nurses day, which is yeah. May 6th. Happy nurses day. Happy Nurses Day to you, Nurse Bauer. Okay, one more question. This is the this is the yep. fun question. You ready? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so this one should make me nervous. I can. Tell. I think it should. If a movie was being made about your life, which actress would you want to play you? Um, Helen Mirren. Oh, good choice. I was going to say Meryl Streep. Well. She was the other one that came into my mind, but okay, you know Helen uh, Helen Mira has been in ads more recently lately, and for an older woman, always she's been gorgeous, but she's a gorgeous older woman, and she's a fabulous actress. Right, right. So I would nominate her. Okay, well I I'll see what I can do. So um, <laughs> because... so I'm going to turn the tables on you. Who would you have? Wait a minute. Hold on. I I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Thank you for asking. So that's I, your homework assignment. Oh, uh, always the teacher. Look at you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for the time and thank you for sharing a, a little bit of your career. I know there's so much more to talk about, but I do en enjoy talking to you all the time and uh, I'm grateful to you for spending time today. Thank you. I, I am privileged and honored. All right. Have a Thank great you. day, Kath. You too. Bye, Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'll tune in next week when we continue our Legends of Nursing series. As it is the month of May, I would like to wish all of my nursing colleagues and friends a very happy Nurses Month. May you be acknowledged and appreciated for who you are and what you do. Thank you for joining us this week. You can find the Lighting Your Way podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google, YouTube, Spotify, and Stitcher. If you liked what you heard, tell a friend and leave us a review. You can learn all about Guardian Nurses Healthcare Advocates on our website, guardiannurses.com. So until next time, Find some joy in your life, pet all the good doggies and kitties, and remember to tell your people that you love them. Take care.